Today, we have a very special guest joining us, Tim Moen. Tim Moen is the Chief Sustainability Officer for Persephone AI and the author of Changing Business from the Inside Out. Tim formerly served as the Chief Executive of the Global Reporting Initiative and held sustainability leadership roles with Intel, Apple, and AMD, working on environmental policy within the U.S. Senate and the U.S. EPA. Thanks again for joining us on The Rocks. Let's dive in. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Tim. I'm excited to have you here on The Rocks. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Emily, and thanks for having me. Awesome. We're excited to have you. And what are you drinking today? I am having some bullet bourbon. Oh, yeah. I don't know who drank the rest of this, but I'm having this. (laughs) (laughs) You're having whatever's left over. Are you a bourbon fan in general? I am a bourbon fan in general, yes. Nice. Well, I am drinking Whistle Pig Boss Hog. This is a rye whiskey, and it's the spirit of mauve that some friends of ours who who came into town uh, brought me. And I had never really heard of it and didn't even realize they're based in Vermont, but a, a great rye. And I thought it would be appropriate for our talk today because when I was looking at it, because I, I didn't know much about the whiskey before they brought it on their website, they talk about their whiskey making process. And they say they ask themselves three questions. How was this done in the past? Have we learned anything since then that can make this better? And is there another way to do this that's worth exploring? And I thought, wow, those are some pretty cool questions to ask as any company. <laughs> Forget about just as a, yeah, for anything, uh, for whiskey, but also given your background and us talking about sustainability and ESG metrics, I thought pretty spot on. Absolutely. Those are great questions for any lifelong learner in any pursuit. Yeah. I was thinking in particular about how many of the things we focus on in the mining industry now are really returning to our roots in a way and doing things the right way but using technology and innovation, maybe to implement it differently, but those core principles never really change about how you work with local populations, how you treat the environment. We might be implementing things differently, but what we're trying to achieve really kind of stays the same. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you got into the sustainability space. I began my career before we had the word sustainability. And if you... (laughs) use the words corporate and responsibility in the same sentence, you would be sure to get a laugh. It just wasn't a thing back then. As a young guy growing up, I always had a thing for the outdoors. You know, my dad used to take me out in the woods and camping, fishing, all of that stuff. And so when it came time to go to school, I decided that uh, I would focus on the environment, which way back then was a weird choice. And, you know, fast forward, sustainability has become kind of a if anything, an overused term in our language. Mm. You know, we're all saying it and very few people know what it means anymore. But I really did start from back in the day when we had environmental science and there were some very defined silos and environment, health, safety, those kinds of things. And over time, what I've seen is just this expansion into so many different issues that have all formed sustainability. And that's really where I am today is kind of defining how that affects corporations and how we can help companies manage those issues better. I think that's an interesting connection in that most people I know in the mining industry, certainly the geologists, they get into it because they like to be outside. You you don't get into geology if you want to sit in a cubicle and make PowerPoints all day, right? These are folks that are drawn to be out hiking and exploring and spending time outdoors, which sometimes I think people forget when they hear mining, right? They, they assume everybody's anti-environment when in fact, most of the people that work in the industry really love to be in the environment and really value it. Mm-hmm. When you hear or think about the mining industry in the context of corporate social responsibility or mining, what comes to mind for you, <laughs> good and bad? You know, I've, I've been in this field a long time, as I said, And a lot of my colleagues would just revile the mining industry. I look at it differently. We need metals. Metals are in everything that we use. So denying that fact is denying reality. And so you have to deal with the world the way you find it and look for ways to make it better. When Billy the Kid was asked why he robbed banks, he said, well, that's where the money is. (laughs) 
you know, if you're asking yourself, where should I work? Well, you should work where you need the most help. Many years ago, I worked for the senator from Montana, Senator Max Baucus. And you talk about a state that had mining issues. I was very deep into the mining industry at that time. It's got a long, long history within the United States and globally. Not all of it good. Yeah, there are absolutely some issues to deal with, but you know that's the place you should work if, if there are issues. Yeah, I think that's where you have the most potential for, for impact. Exactly. That's certainly something that, that we try to communicate, for example, to impact investors or people who are really excited about green energy, clean energy, is if you want these things to come to fruition, you've got to get behind the mining industry and nudge it in that direction or push it into that direction. Because like you pointed out, we need these metals to make that a reality. And so you better make sure the the company is mining the metal that you're going to use to build wind turbines and solar panels and electric vehicles are mining it in an environmentally safe and sustainable way, to use the overused term, sustainable way. Otherwise, what have you accomplished, right? That's exactly right. And, and, you know, you're bringing me into an issue that's much more recent. I worked in the area of conflict minerals Mm -hmm. just a few years ago when I was in the electronics industry. And that was, at the time, just a shocker to us. You know, you're making the world's most high-tech products, and you're being asked to deal with in many cases, artisanal mining. You know, these are people that are really just scraping things out of the earth. And it wasn't even the environmental conditions around the mines. It was the social conditions around those artisanal mines. You know, I've I've gotten a little experience with that. And uh, it was quite a defining moment in my career to to, uh, actually work on those issues and see the impact that we could have from one end of the supply chain to the other. In fact, I was just reflecting on this the other day because I, I had an opportunity to speak at the United Nations about what we had done in this space. And it was a really um, good case study of how you can impact a supply chain. How did you engage on that with the consumers of the minerals? Like, how do you get those technology companies to be general, like the Apples, the Samsungs, to pay attention to the conditions on the ground of a cobalt mine, for example, in the Congo, right? Where Like you're pointing out, it's working conditions with safety. It's child labor in a lot of cases, or what we would at least perceive to be considered child labor. How do you get those companies to pay attention to that? Because it's so many steps down that supply chain. Yeah, and that that was the hardest part, to be honest, Emily, was, um, you know, the river in Egypt denial. I can remember specifically having these internal debates and, and sometimes flat out arguments about why our companies should get involved in this topic at all. And of course, there's activism, and and then there was the Dodd-Frank law, and there were a lot of pressures on us. But really what turned it was this. If if the words corporate responsibility are to mean anything, then if these egregious activities are happening happening anywhere in our supply chain, we need to act. Mm -hmm. And so it was that sort of gut check of do the right thing, guys, and, and we got over that hump. And then it was a real interesting process of mapping out the supply chain. You know, we didn't even know where these materials were coming from, frankly. Yeah. And when we looked at the whole map, we, we saw this choke point, which was smelters and refiners. Mm. And so we set up a smelter and refiner auditing program and certified smelters and refiners. But what was interesting about that story is you quickly got to the point where you were getting conflict-free minerals. You were getting Congo-free minerals. Yeah. And it was starving the country of really important economic income for them. these people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was making things better. In other words, it was making things worse. So we had to quickly then pivot into ways to provide resources and capacity building for the miners and the, the mining industry that were doing it right. That's a, it's interesting you say that about the Dodd-Frank Act in particular, because a few years ago at the PDAC conference, I was asked to arrange the meetings for the Minister of Mines for Rwanda because they were frustrated that they were trying to improve in Rwanda compliance with conflict mineral you know, legislation or, or the requirements around the Dodd-Frank Act, but there was no way for them to kind of graduate out of the Dodd-Frank Act. Right. They were saying, you know, it it puts us in this bucket with the Congo. And yes, we've had issues. But how do we prove to you that we're not 
that we shouldn't still fall under that law anymore, which I thought was a really interesting challenge because it does happen. Like you said, it just moves the purchasing around, right? And then those people are left with no livelihoods. How did you resolve that if you did? Or what did you do to to go in and do capacity building? Or what do you think companies should do? It was a really good case study in in what I call um, collaboration. So we had both collaboration and competition. Uh, We had companies that were tooth and nail in the marketplace, but collaborating on this issue. But even there, you had in the collaboration, some companies that would go out and do more than others. And and I remember specifically uh, Motorola came up with this idea called Solutions for Hope, where they had not only mapped to the smelter, but all the way back to the uh, the original mines and created a sort of closed pipe all the way to their products. And so they would only buy through that closed pipeline. And by doing that, they were able to sort of eliminate all other sources. Very expensive, very hard to do. Not all companies could do it. Yeah, I know um, there's a company we're familiar with called Cobalt Blockchain that is trying to use blockchain as a technology to document the flow of cobalt from the Congo and document it at each step so those miners can go back and show no, like this is my this is my cobalt. I mined it and I sold it to this guy and he sold it to that guy and they brought it to the refinery. So yes, this cobalt's okay to buy. You know, the very mechanical problems in the supply chain that because of the nature of commodities and minerals, like once you mix all that cobalt in together, <laughs> like how do you how do you know the good stuff from the bad? Well, I, you know, people were doing sort of uh, molecular footprinting of the sources of the materials. There were some low tech solutions like bag tags. You know, if this bag suddenly gained weight, you know, that was a problem, et cetera. It's all from the high tech to the low tech to the closed pipe solutions. I think there was everything that was tried. But, you know, I've I've lived long enough to know that if people want to do shenanigans, they do them. So, you know, it's a really good case study to, again, tie the supply chain together. Mm -hmm. And I think it goes back to our earlier discussion of the expanding boundaries around corporate responsibility. You know, what is a company like an Apple really responsible for? Yeah. I mean, they actually don't make their products even. They just design them. But as, you know, sort of that that entity with the big brand, they do have responsibility through the value chain. And they're, I think increasingly their consumers want to make sure that that they're buying a product that's made responsibly or, or that reflects their values. I mean, that certainly seems to be, at least from a marketing angle, a big trend. That's exactly right. And I do think there's there's a, an upside here as well. When, you know, you really think about what you just said in terms of consumers, you know, that's the very end of the, the value chain. But if you look through the supply chain, you know, I remember when I worked for Apple, we, you know, started to have a code of conduct that really, if a supplier didn't meet the code of conduct and we did check, then they just weren't a supplier. And so, you know, good behavior, meaning sustainability oriented behavior, begets business as well. And that's where I I find it interesting that some of these companies, uh, I think both Apple and Samsung were in discussions, if not finalized, purchasing cobalt directly from miners, or they were evaluating that, right, as a way that they could maybe cut out the middlemen and purchase directly from the people on the ground. And I wonder if that's something that we'll see you look at Tesla having their own lithium mines now, right? And and building a, a really vertically integrated chain from, from mineral production up until the end product. And do you think that would solve problems or <laughs> create more of them? I guess could do could do either, right? I think it's really interesting. It's kind of like a pendulum because I can remember when, you know, the age of globalization first came around and we had just-in-time delivery and everything was sort of a a segmented portion of the supply chain and you you swam in your lane and you did your your core competency and that's it. And now it feels like, especially with the pandemic, you know, when supply chains got distorted, there's this movement to go back to complete vertical integration. And to your point, you know, throughout the value chain uh, from raw materials to final product, I'm not smart enough to know the answer of what's better. (laughs) 
but uh, I have seen it uh, kind of swing back and forth. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. And looking at these supply chains, I know what you're doing right now with Persephone really ties in enabling organizations and institutional investors to measuring carbon footprint, right? Which is a whole other component of how do you evaluate the sustainability of a supply chain? Yeah, it's a great lead in. I, I think that, you know, taking a step back, I've had this long career in sustainability and previously leading the global reporting initiative, you know, which sets standards for all companies that want to disclose their sustainability results. And then after all of those years working on all that, all those companies, I made this switch because even the leading companies don't have the foundational systems to measure what they're doing. Mm. You know, I use the the example of financial systems. Like every company has a, a CFO and they're able to not only on a quarterly basis, but sometimes on a weekly basis, know what their their financial situation is and they can forecast it out into the future. It's nothing like that when it comes to ESG information. And of all of the environmental, social and governance information, the ESG information, the most mature is carbon. And it's also probably the most urgent. And even there, among the leading companies, the, the sort of state of the art is to run around at the end of the year, gather up information from across the company, and then report it to show that you're a good corporate citizen. This is really not a management system. This is a, you know, this is a reputational system. So having real-time information you know, that you can both you know, manage and forecast will really change the game. Yeah, and I think that's so spot on in in mining in particular, because everybody talks about how they have an ESG plan, right, or an ESG program, and everybody says the right things about what they want to do. But I began my career in IBM supply chain management group, believe it or not, strange for a geologist, but coming out of college, you know, we were Lean Six Sigma mapping everything, and I really learned you can't improve something if you can't measure it. So as you mentioned, carbon is maybe the most, you know, not not the easiest by any means, but the most far along in terms of measuring. But how do you measure governance? How do you measure the social aspect of ESG? Because if you can't measure it, you can't hold people accountable. And you can't really manage if you don't have accountability, right? I mean... That's exactly right. It's the old Peter Drucker comment, what gets measured gets done. And I've seen that throughout my career and even in cases where, and this is taking me back to the social issues, when, you know, when I was at Apple and we were looking at suppliers, we were doing audits and it was, you know, the, the criteria would say things like uh, adequate dorm space. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. so we had to define it, right? How many square meters per person? How many people in a room, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to have some sort of um, benchmarks in order to be accountable. And I think that's just common sense, right? Yeah. And when you've worked in previous spaces where you were pulling multiple companies together, it must be challenging to get them to agree on a metric or a calculation. It is. The first thing you look for is, are there international standards? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, if there are, they're they're not specific enough, like I just said. And so you have to then, you know, come to a point of agreement And then you have this other confounding factor of local law is local laws can appear to be very stringent, but they're largely ignored. And so you have this this weird sort of extrajudicial responsibility of sort of setting a a benchmark or a baseline. Uh, I use the the working hours exhibit. You know, we we had a, a international standard of no more than 60 hours per week for any individual. It's actually a tighter law in some countries like China, but they just don't enforce it. And so, you know, we, we had to set our own limit and say, that's the limit. Yeah. And I would imagine similarly with environmental standards in some countries, or there may be different environmental standards, country to country, and in mining in particular, the governments approve your environmental plans and, and really every aspect of a mine development. So you walk that line between what does the company want to do and what does the government require or will enforce us to do? That's exactly right. And it reminds me of my days at Intel. We used to have this philosophy at Intel called copy exactly. Mm. 
And it meant that we were going to have one set of standards where, regardless of where we did business. And we were in many, many countries. And when I was the head of the environmental department globally, I remember we were working in the Philippines. Some of the people who came to work in our factories in the Philippines said the safest part of their day was at work. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, our safety standards were the same everywhere, regardless of where we did business. And so when they entered those gates, you know, their, their level of safety went way up. Yeah. No, that, that's a really good point. Um, and, and is a wonderful thing for companies that can, that can hold that standard globally. That's tremendous. We were talking a little bit about how some of these standards can be considered a, uh, not really a management tool, but a marketing tool. Or I mean, there must be phrases that you get so sick of hearing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What are you so sick of hearing in this space? And you're like, just, I don't ever want to hear anybody pitch me this or use this like phrase ever again. Yeah. Well, it, it starts with sustainability itself, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and then, you know, this concept of uh, ESG investing, mm. because I don't think people know what it means. You know, I was trained as a scientist and, and when you look at, uh, the various issues under this broad rubric we call sustainability, they're as, as different as different can be. And yet we have some of the analysts in this space, you know, combining them all up and dividing by whatever, you know, so you're taking things like diversity and climate change. And does one offset the other? Of course not. But somehow they figure out a way to do that. That's the part of it that I think we start to lose some credibility. So do you think there are some things that you can quantify and other things that it really will always remain for lack of a better word, like warm, fuzzy stuff, right? Where you, it is like a, an individual evaluation. Can you quantify whether diversity outweighs environmental standards or is that just not? I think you can within, you know, a, let's say a fungible category, you, you can absolutely quantify and you should quantify and even in the sort of less quantifiable areas, like the ones about governance and policies and management systems, there are ways to define whether a management system is any good. Hmm. Do you have the right uh, sort of feedback loops? You know, the old ISO 14,000, look at a management system and you can figure out whether it's working. But it's between the categories that I have trouble, you know, because they are so very different and they cannot really be combined and compared. We're always held up to the financial system. The financial system is measuring one thing, which is money. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to measure 30, 35 things yeah. that, that are so very different. They're all very important. And I think that can be absolutely quantified and held accountable within a fungible boundary, but they can't really be compared one against the other. So then when you hear about like double bottom line investing, or impact investing. I mean, so what I understand about that is people do try to quantify the value of a positive impact, essentially, and put it into almost accounting speak. Does that just drive you crazy? <laughs> well, certainly can. I mean, I have, I have a Jekyll and Hyde sort of mixed feelings about this. Um, the negative part is when, you know, you take it too far and you're just sort of greenwashing the entire thing like we were just talking about. The positive thing is when businesses and their investors are finding value in doing the right thing. Right. And I'm starting to see more and more of that. You know, we had the annual Larry Fink letter a couple of weeks ago. Larry Fink's the CEO of BlackRock, which is the world's largest asset manager now running, I think, about $8 trillion in investment. It's huge. Mm -hmm. So they probably own, I don't know, 10% of every company on the planet. So when Larry talks, people listen. Yeah. And, you know, he's basically saying that climate change is the existential threat of our time. If we don't get this right, nothing else matters. And so, you know, they're going to hold all of the, the companies they, they own stock in accountable to manage their climate change uh, emissions, which I think is brilliant, right? Because they're seeing that their own, the value of their own investments is being manifest through this sustainability issue. And therefore, they need companies to kind of jump on board and manage that issue. I think that's that's a wonderful virtuous cycle of value and sustainability. And that's, that's I think, where the world is going to this converged future. 
Well, and I think that idea of how do you balance or compare apples to oranges, essentially, is the problem that the mining industry gets stuck in in the discussion around the metal that you need for a low carbon future. How do you calculate or balance the environmental impact of mining or the potential environmental impact and social impact as opposed to the environmental and social good that's created by the metal (laughs) that comes out of the mine? What I would say is monetization of externalities, right? And I know that sounds like a lot of gibberish. If you're mining a particular mineral and that operation has some environmental damage or some, you know, social issues, what is the value of those costs, those impacts? Yeah. And, you know, shouldn't we incorporate those costs into the price of that mineral? It's the monetization of the externalities. I think that's a little bit too ivory tower. You know, it sounds great if you're, you know, an economist working at a university, but in the real world is a lot simpler. You know, it comes down to kind of doing the right thing. Yeah. And that can be driven by good old command and control regulation, or it can be driven by increasingly mindful mm-hmm. corporate leaders who, who understand that doing the right thing actually has long-term value for their corporation. They see it in their brand value. They see it in their investors. They see it in their employees. I'm a pretty old guy, so I've seen a lot of young folks come into corporate leadership that sort of bring this sense with them. And it's fairly inspiring. I agree. And I think part of what leadership can do in the mining space is connect these raw materials with the big picture more. As opposed to if, if a mining CEO is asked about ESG issues, talking about engagement with the local population and their water management or pollution plan, right? That's very local and very almost sounds like you're defending what you're doing as opposed to look, we've got to mine this copper because everybody in the world needs more copper so we can have low carbon energy, right? That's where we fit in the big picture as opposed to just, you know, yes, there may be problems. There are always problems at the local corporate level with any business, right? You're always going to deal with that. But but this is almost an existential question of how can the mining companies contribute to, you know, the future that everybody says they want. It brings up an interesting issue. I think it's about confronting the the tough issues. Mm. If you're a corporate leader in any any industry, but especially in mining, it reminds me when when I was with Intel, we we got this amazing deal to build a factory in New Mexico, and so we built it. Couldn't pass up the deal, and because it was such an amazing deal, it had some downsides with the local community. You know, we weren't paying the tax base and. You know, we were overrunning the roads and the schools, et cetera, et cetera. And so we ended up with this big sort of backlash that I can remember having to, you know, stand in front of those crowds and deal with the tough outrage people. That's real. You know, whether it makes sense scientifically or not doesn't matter. They're going to be outraged. Yeah. And sort of taking that in, understanding it, commiserating with it, and then doing what you can to mitigate the situation and make it better. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of being a good corporate leader is is listening and listening hard. Yeah. And I think uh, I always return to, it sounds silly, but the Boy Scout motto. My dad was an Eagle Scout and we were always taught growing up in Maine. You know, you do a lot of camping, hiking. You always leave the campsite cleaner than you found it. Yep. And I think that really gets to it if you approach communities and projects under the premise that we're going to do what we can, not just to keep everything the way it is and not screw it up, <laughs> but actually improve you know, your day-to-day life and the environmental standards of the area. It's amazing how quickly that approach can change the tone of a conversation, right? What can we do to improve the way the water is right now, as opposed to how can we make sure we don't dump nasty stuff in it? Exactly. So it's not so much a trade-off for the economic activity. You get the economic activity and the benefits of that. Plus, we're going to leave this better than we found it. Yeah, that's where perception is very different from reality and where marketing and messaging can really help because the mining industry in, in most cases really does do things the right way and leaves things better than we find it. But we don't talk about it that way. Right. We're, we're almost 
not to psychoanalyze a whole industry, but we're defensive, right? We know that people think we're dirty, nasty, environmental polluters, right? And it's like you go into the conversation just prepared to explain how we're not going to screw it up. Yeah, so there's two parts to that. One is, like I said, dealing with the outrage factor and just understanding that no matter what you say, people are going to be outraged. Yeah. Second part is is having the data, you know, the accountability piece that we were discussing earlier. Mm-hmm. You know, when, once you get past the outrage and start to have a reasonable conversation, it's like, let's look at the actual data here. Data talks, right? If, if you're able to demonstrate that, you know, you've done the best job possible, I think that matters. Yeah. And even when I was working in Afghanistan, the U.S. Geological Survey really, I was so happy they, they insisted that we do a baseline water quality assessment in all of the areas that we worked in before we started working, right? Like go in and look at how the water is now and communicate that to the local population, right? So first off, the community knows if they have any pre-existing issues with their water supply. And that way, if something happens later on, you know whether it's your fault or not, right? And if it's not, then you can go back and say, you know, let's look at the data. We can help you solve the problem, but this isn't because we did some exploration or, or built a mine over here. Bring, I'm sorry to be such a storyteller, but it brings back a, another one. We, we used to have this issue when I was at Intel and we were building factories. And it was really important for us to have clean wastewater that went into the receiving body of water. And we were building a factory in Costa Rica, beautiful place, love to go visit that factory. But you know, our clean wastewater was going into one of the most polluted rivers you've ever seen, the Rio Segundo. And I'm like, guys, we're actually making this river cleaner, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't we go right. upstream and deal with all those industries and get them to stop? Well, in, in the same way, you know, I think you can really have unintended consequences on the social side. I'm reminded of a uh, it wasn't our team, but another group in Afghanistan looked at how the the women were coming to having to walk miles each day to go get water at the wells and thought, oh, we're going to drill wells closer to their homes. so They don't have to walk so far. Right. So we're going to save these women hours a day. It's grueling. It's terrible. Well, then the women got really upset, got outraged because in in that area, that was the only time the women could socialize with each other was when they Mm -hmm. could leave their family compounds and go get water at the well and they would see each other every day, right? So it it really goes back to before you do anything, you really have to understand the area that you're working in environmentally, but also socially, right? What you really got to have an integrated team that can inform you about what's really going on. It's really important to understand the social context. Uh, I can remember working in the Chinese factories that made uh, Apple products or our biggest issue was was overtime. You know, people wanted to work as much as possible. And we thought, well, what if we just, you know, increase the pay? Then then clearly they, they won't want to work so much overtime. No, they worked more. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason was, you know, you have to understand the context. I mean, most of these people were young people who had moved from a city very far away and they were living and working there. And so all they really wanted was to work as hard as possible and make as much money, save it up and go home. And go home. You know, and, and if you don't understand that that paradigm, you're you're making bad decisions. Yeah, your your financial model can lead you to uh, <laughs> to really put some bad inputs. It's true, because no matter how different a country is from where you are, if you don't pay attention to those kinds of details, right? The devil's always in the details and what you try to do. Exactly. So if you were able to wave a magic wand and change the way companies deal with sustainability or corporate social responsibility in your perfect world, what would that look like? We've always treated sustainability as a risk to be dealt with, as a way to sort of clean things up and make them better. If we could flip that around and make it into a business opportunity, a design criteria for Mm -hmm. business, it would change everything. So every company has its own core competency. The reason it exists to produce some product or service that makes them good at what they do, that makes them a value creator. 
So you, you take that core competency and you look at the problems of the world, the sustainability problems of the world, be the environmental, social, or whatever, and you say to yourself, what can our core competency do to make those problems better? And in many cases, you'll find a business. You'll find some way to create value. I remember when Unilever took this on and they realized that, you know, selling their, you know, soap and shampoos and other products the way they did in Western countries just simply didn't work. And they had to sell them in little tiny single use packets and other ways to make their products work in other countries. That kind of thinking, like what what can we do to bring sanitation in that case or in other, uh, in other locations with other problems, what can we do with our core competencies to solve their issues? There was, there was a, a book a long time ago, and it's, I think it's in its third edition now, called Capitalism at the Crossroads. Stuart Hart wrote the book, and it, it's an amazing treatise that, that goes right to this issue. It's like, how can we take the forces of capitalism that work, that create value, create profit, create jobs and income, and apply those forces to these problems. That's what I would do with my magic wand. Yeah, I mean, that's such a great point because people who say sustainability doesn't add function, right, or it doesn't add concrete value, it's like people pay more money every day for something that's beautiful and easy to use and that they enjoy, right? I mean, just look at the iPhone, right? I mean, I mean part of why people love iPhones is because of the experience. So what if that experience included, you know, those those larger issues? Mm -hmm. That's really fascinating. And it makes me think about how we talk about those terms and make them seem less cheesy, <laughs> right? Or, less, uh -huh. you know, I think because people are so smart and they, they really can tell sometimes if you're just feeding them, like you said, the annual report about, you know, making up a bunch of bullet points to say you've done a good job. I mean, I think people really can see through a lot of that. And how do you how yeah. people genuinely connect with with it when you're really doing it for the right reasons? I, I agree with you. I think making the conversation more meaningful is in strong demand. I just had this reflection because um, right now I'm a, um, I signed up. I always do this to myself. I signed up to uh, to be a judge of a bunch of sustainability reports in Asia. Oh, gosh. I yeah. know. So now I have to actually read them. So you really need that glass of bullet. That you've I really do. Uh, <laughs> each one of these reports is, you know, 100, 130 pages of materials. You know? And I'm like, oh, this is such not a, a really good way of communicating. So on the one hand, you have the need for compelling storytelling, because not everybody's going to geek out on the data, nor should they, right? Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you have the need for strong data, accountability, you know, results matter, KPIs. I think you can do both. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to have 100 pages of pretty pictures of children planting trees. There are ways to communicate your story both effectively and with data. At AMD, we actually split the two reports. We put the data online and, and all the analysts could kind of get that. And we tried to keep it up to date as much as possible. This is where Persephone is, is to provide real-time data. But we also did the sort of more marketing-oriented uh, treatment that, that you know, our sales team absolutely loved. Yeah. Well, and because beyond just uh, the sales aspect, that storytelling is so important because I think in a way it connects people, right, to the genuine motivations of what you're trying to do. Because I think it's also important when we look at companies trying to do the right thing, going back to that Rwanda example, you know, going from black to white is not one to two. It's There's a lot of gray in the middle there. So how do you support a company or tell the story of a company trying to do the right thing and making progress when they're not the best example out there yet? I think you can have both. I, I completely agree that storytelling is incredibly powerful. We are just people, right? And we respond to stories, you know, the goosebumps and tears that you get when you watch a, a sad movie or a romantic movie. Those Sarah McLachlan um, puppy rescue commercials <laughs> that always seems to play. <laughs> so we have our right brain and our left brain and we have the analytical and we have the emotional and I think you can do both. And I, I think smart companies know that. 
Yeah. You know, you, you sort of pull that story, that example, that anecdote, and you provide the, the accountability that shows the entire enterprise. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a really great distinction, too, that the data is valuable for accountability internally as much as it is externally. So if you as a leader are trying to drive change in your organization, yeah, some of that data may be, you know, numbers that that you report out, but it's also as important to report in and tell your team, this is our objective and here's where we are. And that doesn't have to be a public, not everybody has to see behind the curtain, but it can really drive change within the organization. I remember I wrote this story in uh, in my book. It, it was it was years ago, but this this ge- this gentleman I know, John Vieira, he used to be with Ford, and he was getting a, an award for his report. And he stood up and he said, "How many people have read this report?" <laughs> and nobody raised their hand. And he said, "Okay, how many people have read your own company's report?" And they all raised their hand. Mm. And and it caused me to write a, a story called "Is Your Report a, a, a Window or Is It a Mirror?" Because we often think of it as a window as being transparent, you know, but frankly, it's much more of a mirror that we hold up to ourselves and we say, you know, have we made met our commitments? Have we made progress against our goals? You know, and and that's much more of how I think the sustainability reporting cycle works. It's much more of an internal management tool. Hmm. And can you think of any suggestions for folks listening who are in the mining industry, who are running mining companies or exploration companies on how can they build a better mirror? Like how can they take a harder look at themselves? Yeah, I think it starts off with uh, something that's more art than science, which is the question of materiality, what's important. And this is the reason it's art, not science, is it is based on context. You know, what's your company doing? Where is it? Where are you involved? Where are you planning to go? Uh, and, and getting all of those things together and holding it up against the list of issues. Mm-hmm. And then I always look at things from two perspectives. What is the magnitude of that issue? And what is the likelihood of that issue actually happening? Mm-hmm. And if you have high magnitude and high likelihood, you put it in the upper right quadrant and <laughs> yeah. start to, to really... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all, everything is a two by two matrix in the end. So, but having that discussion among corporate leaders, and I've done these, I don't know, a dozen times in my career. Mm-hmm. Not only is it super impactful, but it can be a lot of fun because people rarely get out of their silos. Maybe they're in marketing or operations or finance or whatever, but you bring them all into a room and you, you set it up right and you can have this really interesting conversation. Yeah, it gives people a chance to think outside the box a little bit. Exactly, exactly. And what I've found over my career is that if if you give some of these folks a little bit of a window towards doing good in their jobs, they light up. I had this one guy when I was at AMD, his job was one of the most boring jobs you could think of, right? He He designed the packaging that went around the semiconductors, the chips that we sold to gaming enthusiasts so they could build their own PCs. Okay. And every year I would go to him and he was so excited to see me because he would tell me, well, this year we made the box smaller and next <laughs> year we're going to use recycled materials. And That's- we have figured out the whole carbon savings from that. You know, he was super into this thing and he loved it. You know, I'm sure he told his kids about it and, you know, it, you give people an opportunity to to weave this into their day jobs and, and it makes their jobs more fulfilling. Well, I think the wonderful thing about getting people to focus on ESG is it pulls people out of that, what is my day-to-day job? What am I doing today? And puts that person, that company in such a larger context. And what is your impact on the world at large and our society. And I think the vast majority of people really appreciate knowing how they can contribute to doing well by doing good, right? I think you're right. By nature, most people want to be really making the world a better place for lack of a a less easy term, right? Who wants to be the bad guy? It comes down to this concept of shared value. That's a term that, that I'm stealing from Michael Porter of Harvard. Porter and Kramer, their, their paper on shared value is definitely worth a read. But basically, the thesis is that you know companies are not charities. They're for-profit institutions. 
And so when you take an action, it needs to have value for the company and hopefully have value for people on the planet around the company, because those two things can be mutually reinforcing and provide shared value. Hmm. And I think it's such a strong point because a lot of people approach this area as if it is sort of a philanthropic, uh, reputational boosting kind of let's get some awards or whatever. And it can be so much more than that. Yeah. And and I really think that that process I mentioned before about digging deep in terms of what are the issues that we as a company can manage and do well at and, and be very careful about choosing wisely, that can really unleash a lot of that shared value. That's another great point that it's as important what you say no to as what you say yes to, right? Like, what are you choosing to take on and, and can you deliver? Exactly, exactly. From my experience working in a lot of post-conflict countries, the impact of our industry was so heightened, right? Mining in Afghanistan, the reason we were there doing that as the U.S. government was because mining had the potential to completely transform their economy and build infrastructure and create tax and royalty revenue to fund hospitals and schools. And, you know, and so it was the, you really were going in there because of the kind of country shaping potential of what the industry could do. And I think sometimes people forget about that, that potentiality is always out there no matter where you're working and it could be for the better or for the worse. Right. And that's where getting people excited and bought into that bigger vision can hopefully help <laughs> shift it towards the better side of the spectrum. Absolutely. Right. Uh, good example. Well, thank you so much for joining us and bringing some uh, some kind of outside the mining industry perspective on your favorite word, sustainability. <laughs> and yeah, a little bit more bourbon. The bottle is a little lower at by the end of the, the podcast. But really, thank you so much, Tim, for joining us and look forward to keeping up with what you and your team are doing and seeing how we can implement that in the mining industry. So cheers. You're very welcome. It's been my great pleasure to speak to you. And uh, I really appreciate having a, a podcast with bourbon. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thank you to our guest and my colleague, Tim Moen, for joining us for this episode of On the Rocks. To learn more about Tim and Persephone, visit persephone.com and check them out on LinkedIn at Tim Moen. For more about Prospector, go to prospectorportal.com or check us out on Instagram at prospectorai and LinkedIn at prospectorportal. Thanks for joining us on the rocks. Until next time, keep your glasses full and your ice cold. Cheers. <laughs>